This is lesson 3.3, and today we're going to be talking about electron configuration. So our goal is to learn how to read and write the electron configuration of atoms and to understand how it is organized on the periodic table. So let's go ahead and jump into it and start with a question. Which element is represented here? There's a few different ways that you could solve this, but perhaps the easiest way would just simply be to count the electrons. How many electrons do we have here? That's right. Two, four, five, six, and seven. And we look up element number seven on the periodic table, and it is nitrogen. Now, this is one way to represent or to show where the electrons are in the atom. But there is another way that we can do it too. We can take that same information and write it in a shorter format called electron configuration. And so the electron configuration for nitrogen is written right here. It is essentially a shorthand way to write exactly the same information, although a little bit of information is lost in that it doesn't show how these are all pointing up. Now, let's go ahead and go over what does everything mean here in this electron configuration. First of all, we notice the 1s, the 2s, and the 2p. Those, of course, are all the different subshells, right? So you have a large number and a letter is going to tell you the subshell. The 1s is the 1s subshell. The 2p here is the 2p subshell. It's exactly the same information that you'll see here on the left of your energy level diagram. Next, what about these superscript numbers? So they're smaller numbers and they're up some. So they're superscripts. It looks like 1s squared, 2s squared, 2p cubed, but it's not. We do not say squared. The way we would read this is 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. Okay? So what are these superscript numbers? They, of course, are the number of electrons in the preceding atomic orbital. So when you say 1s2, what does that mean? This 1s2 means that you have two electrons in the 1s subshell. The 2s2 means that you have two electrons in the 2s subshell. The 2p3 means that you have three electrons in the 2p subshell. And we can do this for any energy level diagram and for any element. So let's try some sample problems for electron configuration. How about let's try to do the electron configuration of boron, all right? So look boron up in the period table. You'll notice that boron is element number five. So boron has five electrons and five protons. So let's do the energy level diagram. So we remember for boron and for everything, 1s is going to be down at the bottom, and then 2s, and then your 2p. And so boron has five electrons. It's going to fill those boxes. It's going to fill those orbitals. One, two, three, four, and five. All right. And so once you see that, we can go ahead and write out the electron configuration of boron. That should be 1s2y because you have two electrons in the 1s. Then it's going to be 2s2 because we have two electrons in the 2s orbital. And then we have 2p1, 2p1, because we have a one electron in the 2p subshell. Okay, so that is the electron configuration for boron. So let's try something else. Let's suppose we want to do, let's say, silicon. Silicon, and that is element number 14. So it has 14 electrons. And we can go ahead and write those 14 electrons out in the electron configuration without drawing the energy level diagram, right? They always start out in the same way. Just like these boxes are always the same for all the different elements, the electron configuration always starts off the same way. The only difference is how many electrons you're going to put into that atom. So for silicon, it's going to be 1s2, right? We still have more electrons. We've got 12 more electrons. 2s2. So we've used up four. We got 10 more. 2p6. So how many electrons is that so far? Two, four, that's 10 electrons, which means we have four more. After the 2p is the 
2s, which can hold up to 2. So how many electrons is that? That's going to be 2, 4, 10, 12, which means we still have two more electrons. What comes after the 3s? That's right. After the 3s is the 3p, which can hold up to six electrons, but we're not going to put that many in, right? We've already put in 12 electrons, so we have only two more electrons to put into the atom, and so it's going to be 3p2. So that is the electron configuration for silicon. Now, I'd like to also start talking a little bit about the periodic table. Now, the periodic table is organized in a very specific way, and it's organized in a way that's related to these energy level diagrams and electron configurations. So let's first look at the different sections in the periodic table and the different periods. Well, first of all, a row, so a row means something that's horizontal here. A row is called a period in the periodic table. We're going to talk about why that is here in a subsequent lesson, but let's just first talk about, well, what can we tell you about the rows in the periodic table? First of all, the row number or the period number is over here on the left. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that row number or period number will tell you the principal quantum number of the outermost atomic orbital that is occupied by electrons. So, for example, if you talk about this element right down here, it has an electron in the 7s subshell. Next, you'll notice that there are various different sections in the periodic table. And these sections are all labeled here. In this periodic table, the blue colored section is all s. It's not that all of their electrons are in s orbitals. Of course not. That's not possible. But it's that their outermost or highest energy level is going to be an s subshell. This is the F group or the F block, which means the elements here have their outermost or highest energy level, which is going to be an F subshell. Here's your D, here's your P, and notice that helium, which is up here, for some good reasons, should actually be in the S group. Now, most periodic tables do not look like this. Instead, they have this F group right here, placed below the periodic table, which you'll see right here. This down here in the purple is the F group, which if you put it on a periodic table, it would make the periodic table so long. So typically it's just put down below, which just makes it nice for making a periodic table in one sheet of paper. But really, this F group should be right in here. Now, in addition to the periods and the sections, we also have a lot of nice information going on in the columns. Every column of elements has the same number of electrons in exactly the same type of outermost atomic orbital. So what do I mean by that? If we look at this column right here, which is just part of the period table, we'll notice that this last part of the electron configuration ends in what? S1, S1, S1. This whole column here ends in S1. This column ends in what? S2, S2. And it's going to continue on that way throughout the period table, right? This whole column right here ends in P3, P3. And notice that as you go down in your periods, you're going to increase this principal quantum number, right? So this is 1S1, this is 2S1, this is 3S1. And that 1, 2, 3 corresponds to the row number or the period number. Now, we can use this information to actually predict the outermost part of any electron configuration of any atom on the periodic table. So this is actually very useful. So let's try this out. For example, if you have the entire periodic table, and let's suppose we wanted to know, well, what is the last part of the electron configuration for, let's say, iodine right here in the periodic table? Well, how would we do that? The first thing we would do is we'd notice, well, how far down is it, right? So this is period one, period two, period three, period four, period five. So it is in period number five. So the principal quantum number should be five. Next, we notice that this is in which section? Over here in the orange, this is the S section. Right here in the teal, this is going to be the D section. Down here in the purple is the F section, and we're not going to really deal with them at all. But here in this lime green color section, this is the P section. Okay, so this is going to be 5P2. 
p. Now, how many electrons are going to be in it? Well, we start over here. It always starts, every section always starts with one. So this is going to be one, two, three, four, and five. So this is going to be five p five for iodine. And we figured that out without doing all the rest of the electron configuration which you could do all the rest of the electron configuration. And you'll notice that all the rest of the electron configuration just goes based on where the element is in the periodic table. So you can do this for any element. All right. And I'd like you guys to give it all a try. Now, the periodic table has a lot of information on it. And we can also use the periodic table in order to figure out that last part of the electron configuration of any element. Now, I should say there are some exceptions to this. There are some elements which have a slightly different order, but I want you guys to realize that those exceptions are completely not important, all right? It's beyond the scope of this course, and it's really not that important for us to understand what the electrons are doing. Now, first of all, let's just remind ourselves what different things mean. So for example, if I say, okay, the element silicon, which period in the periodic table is silicon in? And we see that silicon is in the third period. What do I mean by that? Okay, so the periods go one, two, and three. And so if you follow this over here, that's the period where silicon is. Now, you might be a little bit confused here because it looks like, okay, just one, two is in the second one, but that's not true. There is a whole period up here. And this top period, period one, has only hydrogen and helium in it. Okay, so it's a very small period. Now, why is this period so small? Why is period one have only two elements in it? Well, because that's for n equals one, which has only the one s, and the one s can only have two electrons in it, and so it can only have one or two electrons in it corresponding to two elements. That's why period one is so small. How about period two? Well, what is this? This is going to be the two s, and this is going to be the two p. And you'll notice the 2s can hold two electrons and the 2p, which is three boxes, can hold up to six electrons, which is why there are eight elements in the second period. Okay, and you can go on throughout the entire period table and see those relationships. So what if we wanted to figure out that last part of the electron configuration of silicon? Okay, so what we can do is we can remember, okay, well, first of all, what period is it in? It's in the third period, right? One, two, three. So it's going to be three. And then we ask ourselves, which section is it in? Remember, over here on the left is the S section. Over here is the P section. So it should be three P. And what about the last number? Within the P section, it is the second one over, right? So this is going to be three P one. This is going to be three P two. So this should be three P two. Okay. One last thing that I do want to mention today are the terms ground state and excited state. So back to the whole energy level diagrams, the idea of ground state is basically everything that we've been talking about so far. So every single energy level diagram, electron configuration that we've talked about so far is in the ground state. The ground state means the most stable electron configuration that an atom can have. So the electrons are all in the lowest possible state. That's why it's called ground state. So lowest possible energy level for all the electrons. The excited state essentially happens when one or more of the electrons get some energy. And when one or more electron gets some energy, it's going to go up to a higher energy level. And as we said before, the electron's not going to stay up here. It's always going to want to come back down. And when it comes back down, it's going to give off a photon. So an excited state essentially is not a stable state. You've basically given one or more of the electrons some energy. And so essentially all you need to do to draw an excited state is just to take one of these electrons or both of these electrons and move them up to higher energy levels. So this is the first excited state of helium, but you can draw essentially an infinite number of different excited states where these electrons can both go up or they can go up to higher energy levels. All right, so we're going to go ahead and end there. Have a great rest of your day. See you guys tomorrow.